John. He is our president of PSL Group. Thank uh, you. Thanks very much, Vijayan. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Sundaraman, the speaker of the day. Uh, we have been having lectures during this uh, lockdown on the coronavirus. We had uh, Dr. Shitabha Sinha from Institute of Mathematical Sciences coming and telling us about the, how the virus spreads. And uh, then we had uh, Dr. Pavitra talking to us about the microbiology. And uh, today we have Dr. Sundaraman looking at it from a public health systems perspective. Uh, we are all worried about what will happen after May 3. You know? uh, once the lockdown is lifted, what is going to happen? Now, this is a major question for uh, the government to answer, for the health systems to uh, look at and answer. And uh, this is what... Uh, am I audible? Shall I continue? Yeah, you can you continue. continue. Uh, so, uh, so, Dr. Sudaraman will be talking about the public health systems perspective in this. Now, to introduce Dr. Sundaraman, uh, he was a faculty member at uh, JIPMER, and uh, he was the former executive director of the National Health, Health Systems Resource Center, and uh, he was formerly dean and uh, head of uh, health systems research at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. But more than all, Sundaraman is the convener and the prime mover of the Janaswasti Andolan, a people's health movement in the country. He has been associated with the people's science movements for a very long time, leading the uh, uh, literacy, national literacy missions work in the 90s, the public uh, health campaign, people's health campaign in for the uh, last uh, three decades effectively. And uh, looking at health from a public health point of view as a right and what it means for uh, uh, people at large. In this, uh, probably there is nobody else who is as qualified in this country to talk about as Dr. Sundaraman, because uh, he has looked at it not only as an academic, as an activist, as an organizer, uh, looking at uh, both academic aspects as well as what it means on the ground, working with governments, working with people's organizations. So he brings a very wide perspective to this. And it's great to have him talk today. Uh, I look forward to the talk. Over to you, Sundar. Thank you, Jan. Thank you to everyone for inviting me. Always a great pleasure to talk to the Tamil Nadu Science Forum of the first time I've done it, and hopefully not the last. So it's nice fun. Uh, I'll get straight to the topic because there's a lot to cover. Of course, the big question in the back of our mind is whether the lockdown will be lifted at May 3rd. I'm not going to, uh, to leave the question uh, about the lockdown to the end. I'm going to assume that the lockdown will be lifted. And we should talk about what are the things that we should be doing when the most lockdown situation. And then we will go back to an understanding of the lockdown itself. And then we will see what are the criteria on terms of lifting on the lockdown. Now, if the first thing that a government will need, the moment uh, this is uh, a lockdown is lifted, is called a disease surveillance. You need to have the data, you need to yeah, have the right evidence now. to um, plan so, uh, any public uh, health response. Um, is, uh, going to... This is very basic, like if a doctor sees a patient, he will need to examine the patient, he will need to see the symptoms, the signs, the laboratory tests before he can decide. We have a public health policy, we have a public health strategy it has to respond to the, has to respond to the uh, outbreak, then it needs data to inform it. Am I audible? Am I audible over there? Yes, uh, you are audible. Yeah, okay. There's somebody who was suggesting that I was. I'm sorry. So, in some sense, we need, and at one point, the heart of 
a government for follow up once it's lifted and even before it's lifted is data now this is the most uh, curious part of it and sometimes uh, makes me angry the country had in place something called the integrated disease surveillance program all of us know it as the idsp it was set up around 2008 and fully functional by about 2010 it is the surveillance system for a large number of diseases about 30 diseases which are not identifiable and which are epidemic prone it had three levels of information one was called s forms or suspect cases with paramedicals would give just on symptoms then there were p forms filled up by 27000 so the s forms came from 150000 uh, reporting units the presumptive forms the p forms came from uh, 27000 to about 30000 uh, no almost 30 40000 medical officers so this was based on a clinical diagnosis by a doctor and then there were a network of labs 188 labs 168 labs which actually confirmed the data and then you had a laboratory confirm some of them for some of the diseases there were even more labs so they were called the l forms this was a weekly report and even if you now go to the idsp portal and check under weekly reports you will see every weekly report from the last 2014 to now every week the last report was put on february 2nd the first week of february and it faithfully and very well in very good professional language the first three covid 19 cases it also has documented outbreaks over the time and if you look at the disease outbreaks every month in the previous year you will find flu outbreaks recorded and compared with the similar months of the previous two years all of this comes to a stop on february 2nd after february 2nd there are no reports which are put up and uh, soon in the beginning they were not reporting and the reports were not being put up in the public domain but i now increasingly hear that the report flow not only for this for all diseases has stopped it's like having a whole fire control system Uh, and the moment the fire breaks out you send out the fire engines and close down the fire station doesn't make sense to do it and now recently they the whole of the flow of information around idea around the covid-19 has been centralized into a two new portals that created the sss is under the special surveillance system is under the ministry of health and the covid-19 collector center is under the icmr and as you all know if you are following it the figures sell very often don't match and at some point surveillance systems take a lot of time to stabilize it takes a lot of time to get it going it took us two years to three years when we did it and in fact it has not stabilized in its danger of collapse it also requires epidemiologists in every district we have more than 200 epidemiologists posts vacant we, you offer people with an mbbs and a mph qualification 25000 per month that keep the job contractual very few join you could take other cadre and train them up we don't do it so there's a whole mess out there but eventually at the moment when you need it most the heart of a strategy of epidemic management now and for all times in the future and all times in the past is a disease surveillance system and unfortunately we are in a deep mess on that and therefore what we need to start with emphasizing is monitoring all types not only the laboratory confirmed covid-19 positive reports that we give but also the suspect cases and the presumptive cases whether or not they present the report at least this monitoring needs to be established one important element of doing so is the whole dialogue around the case definitions now if you say ili is influenza like illness and influenza like illness in my mind should be treated as covid-19 until otherwise proven at the time maybe not in february certainly not in january why do we so so because the influenza flu which is the most common differential diagnosis is much more susceptible to social distancing than covid-19 
So it's much more likely to be transmitted and going around than COVID-19. And therefore, you need to test them. I know from backdoor information, so to speak, that in Madras, there has been a large fever survey. And the fever survey finds a lot of patients with fever of more than three to four days, symptoms, but most of them were not tested for it. And unless you test people with flu-like symptoms, unless you test severe acute respiratory infection, what is used, the term SARIs. So unless you test all ILIs and SARIs, as defined and there's a clinical definition so you don't need to report only what is COVID-19 positive you can report even if it is not being tested you will get a sense of where the spikes are you won't notice the spikes at the national level or state level that would be a huge epidemic before you notice it but if in one particular way or there is a spike or there is a spike in number two or something you would be able to pick it up. So at the block level, at the district level, these uh, case definitions gives you extremely important, actionable information. And then you have to define what a contact is. And sometimes over here, there's all sorts of silliness in describing a contact. 15 minutes face to face with less than two meters separation is a contact, not if you just cross each other. And also at some point, okay, you are in a room or in an air conditioned room where there's a circulation for a long time, share public. So in enclosed spaces, public transport, there are higher risks. So you don't actually land up quarantining everybody. So Kerala will quarantine about 200 patients, uh, contacts for every case. Another state will quarantine about four contacts for every case. And this whole definition of contact, if it is not stabilized, you're going to actually land up quarantining a whole lot of unnecessary persons and missing it. Second, when you will react to an outbreak, one case of ILI or four or five, a severe acute these are all important criteria. And then you need to follow up with fever service so that whenever you catch a case, you will need to be identify a fever, you need to test it and put that contact. And all those in contact have to be kept under observation and you are going to, I'll come back to that, but basically identifying early is half the game. And a surveillance system is what does it best, but you will need at times of a pandemic house-to-house -house search. Now, house-to-house -house searches are now going to yield very poor results. That's because we are stigmatized and uh, criminalized, even communalized this whole disease in a very deep way. And therefore, the general thing, if somebody comes to the house and somebody has a fever, is not to go confess, not to seek care. Anyway, testing is not possible. The whole instinct is to hide. The whole instinct is to actually not confess to the disease. And unless, and I've been telling the government this, unless they take up a major, major campaign to destigmatize the disease, make it comfortable and non-threatening for people to report, withdraw coercive measures on this, you're not really going to get the information even if the testing is in place. So the first and foremost part of it, which I would emphasize is the necessity for surveillance of this. Now, let me come to the second part of it. And I've got this slide. I don't know whether many of you are familiar with it. You may not be. I'll assume you're not. But it's an important slide to make sense of the confusion that is going around in testing, false positives, false negatives, what test, when to test, why to test, etc. Testing is largely two types, antigen tests and antibody tests. And within that, I shall be dealing with the RT-PCR, uh, and which is an antigen test, and the rapid test kits. The RT-PCR requires, it's a costlier, it requires a certain set of equipment, it requires biosafety guidelines, it requires, it can't be done everywhere. But in Tamil Nadu, for example, now they say they have established 38 centers, which is good because you can, collection can be from 170 centers, but you can then in proper transport medium, transport it to these places and get a report. But you may get three days to get the report. 
the report is highly specific. That means if it says it's positive, it's positive. There's no doubt about it being positive. But it can lead to a lot of false negatives. And uh, sensitivity reports, some will give you bad the feel of about 50% and some will say 70%. It also depends upon the disease load. So if you look at this blue line here, the blue line is the virus. It about the fifth day it appears in titers good enough to be certainly detected by RT-PCR could be picked up by a more sensitive system earlier. They say the new Roche test will pick it up even in the second third day. By the seventh day, it will definitely be picked up. It will continue to rise till about the tenth day, which is the period of being symptomatic. So between the seventh and the seven days, you are asymptomatic. And therefore, that's called the incubation period, the period between when you get infected and when you show symptoms. But by the time you are showing symptoms, you are already infected and there is a virus load. And then you are shedding the virus and the fever stops around the 14th day and rapidly the virus count declines because you have uh, the antibodies have built up. And the antibodies are countering and therefore the fever goes off and therefore if it is not enough virus to cause the fever there's not enough virus or viable enough to cause infection so infectivity goes down and the test starts becoming negative whereas when you do the antibody test there are two types of antibody an igm and an igg the if you do these tests and you detect in the early stage, you will get a false negative because the antibodies haven't built up. So does that make the test useless? No, it does not make the test useless. You just don't use it before the symptoms have developed. You wait for three days of the symptom to develop. And after the fourth day, they have put a rule saying seventh day in the ICMR guideline. There's a problem with that. But after the fourth day, if you're going to do a rapid uh, test kit, you will combine what you see in the test with what you see in the clinical setting. And putting it together, the doctor makes a diagnosis. I diagnosed typhoid on the basis of a Vidal test. The te Vidal test has a worse sensitivity and specificity than any one of these tests. But it is still a very effective test for Vidal. If I know to use it within a clinical setting, I have ruled out other possibilities and I use it. So the advantage of it is it's cheap. It can be done in every primary center. It requires much less safety measures and it's rather rapid. But, and you have to work your way around the false negatives. Now, if there is some concerns that the tests that have come, when they were validated, there were antibodies in the blood, but it failed to pick up. That's another story. That's a problem of not detecting it. But sometimes when you hear the false positives and negatives that the viral thing was positive, but this was negative, that's not the way you would describe a test failing or not failing. You will actually describe it against a gold standard in testing. You would say we have built a gold standard for IgM, IgG measurements and when the gold standard we were doing it in the lab, it showed it when it did. You don't see that. So I'm not too sure about what they are saying about the uselessness of it. And also they keep saying that it is used only for zero surveillance. It has have no use for clinical testing. It's not true. It, clinical testing along with the clinical finding in the hands of a doctor is very relevant and it may be the easier one to make available. If you put a patient in an intensive care setting and the test report takes three days to come, all your surrounding people are managing it. All your, uh, all your uh, nurses, your doctors, and if they don't know that it is COVID-19, they deal with it differently, even if it is a suspect. So there is a great advantage in knowing, even if you have and make it necessary for a confirmation later. So therefore, who should be tested? So you need this testing for providing clinical care. You need it because you want to isolate them early. And this is the big problem in testing in uh, Tamil Nadu and in fact, all of India today. Every other country in the world tests symptomatic. They have an argument about and differences about you should whether you should test everybody that are symptomatic. That's under debate. But that you should test symptomatics is sort of taken for given. 
in india we don't test symptomatics we test everybody else very recently they started announcing we are testing symptomatics but that may have started only in chennai just a few days back it's really and there were many reasons established none of them very convincing but the big danger which i have been pointing out is these patients with mild and moderate and continuing to worsen often don't sit at home they board a bus they take some tra transport they reach a hospital stand in a queue don't get treated go to another hospital stand in a queue the doctor sends them to the laboratory stand in another queue then they go to get the test done uh, collect their drugs another queue they land up infecting 500 people at an average because this whole health seeking is intensive behavior so unless you are able to provide a channel for testing people with symptoms that to worsening symptoms in a period of anxiety these symptomatics are going to spread now we don't know this for sure but all models use it it's a safe assumption to say that people who are symptomatic are far more likely to be infected and far more intensely infected than people who are asymptomatic 5 to 1 there have been some papers here and there but broadly this is true but that is another reason why you should not miss testing symptomatics other than the fact that if you test randomly you have people with no symptoms you have people with past symptoms and you have present and your pool is diluted it has a role in zero surveillance but it is certainly going to be for for an epidemic surveillance as different from a research study understanding herd immunity understanding a zero surveillance as valid but for immediate control of it you need to test and if you do test for symptoms you have to find two ways of doing it either they ring up a call center and you reach their home and take the test asking them to go on isolation till we get a report or you refer them to a center and they reach that center by private transport and failing reaching by private transport they are brought by a covid-19 dedicated ambulance where they get tested otherwise every time they come to get tested the auto driver the taxi driver the bus driver and all its passengers the train the local train in madras or bombay is it worth it you can't really make a sense and very often that's what they do they say okay you come over and we'll test you what does it mean and at some point you if you don't build these systems of a helpline responded to by a testing you are actually promoting infection rate on that at some point if you do that and put them in isolation you do that so among people to so you test to prevent spread and isolate it is evidence for planning and it informs your clinical care you test people who are symptoms it's a must but you also test people who are primary contacts which has a standard of being a contact as i said i wouldn't waste my time with secondary contacts a contact is a secondary contact is a contact of a contact who doesn't have the disease it makes no sense but a lot of the tests and therefore you also high risk people like doctors healthcare providers one type of high risk cancer patients another type of high risk policemen a third level of high risk international level a fourth level of high risk so these are types of high risk that you will test now random testing has its particular role now you choose your tests and your combination of tests according but in india there are in when we break come out of the lockdown there are two or three problems that you need to understand tamil nadu reports that 80% of its patients are asymptomatic and 89% come from a single source what they are referring to is the tablighi muslim my understanding of it is it's simply because all of one known chain of transmission you did a good job you really traced everybody even those who are asymptomatic and tested and you failed to test all others why are you having lockdowns in cities why are you having lockdowns in different places if there is no transmission happening over there you are locking down at a lot of our severe cases and deaths i have from journalists that about 150 cases over here do not have any contact history and you say no no we are trying to find out whether they have a contact that's not the spirit of transmission so your low positivity rate is not a strength your low asymptomatic rate is not a strength you have been 
overly emphasizing contact tracing, including secondary contacts, including random testing in high risk populations, which you have been underplaying and by policy excluding symptomatics from being tested, which is one reason why, which could explain this among other reasons. And of course, part of the reason is that you have a very big scarcity in test kits even now. We do not have an indigenous manufacturer. When Iceland had it, when South Korea had it, even before they thought of lockdown, they first went and met their private sector, which had the capacity, gave them the virus samples, gave them the technology, gave them the finances, and asked them to ramp up testing. When their first death happened in Iceland, they already had enough test kits for people to take a test. There are many countries where before you board a flight, you can get tested. And if the test results come with COVID-19, okay, you're welcome to go. So if testing is not such a complex process. It could have been bought, but we have become dependent on global supply chains and the global supply chains are stressed. The loss of indigenous capacity, though potentially we have it, has been a major problem. Now, let me come to the third slide. The next major issue is isolation and tracing. The difference between quarantine and isolation, positive cases you isolate, contacts you quarantine. COVID negative patients who may become positive, positive are quarantined. If they are positive, they are isolated. The problems of managing quarantine are rather more than the problems of managing isolation. COVID-19, you know they are infected, they can be placed with other people, they are infected. But in quarantine, you are placing them in a high-risk situation where many others have a like, the likelihood of infection is more, but they are not infected. And they themselves, maybe in any quarantine situation, only about 25% will turn out to be actually positive. But that's much higher than in the general population and you're mixing them. So you will have to separate cohorts and prevent transmission within quarantine. That is why for quarantine, home quarantine is preferred or dedicated community quarantine, community managed quarantine centers, like they took hotels, they took apartment blocks and put people into quarantine and provided them go over there. Whereas when it comes to something like that is much better rather than putting them into a hospital situation for quarantine. Um, hospitals are good for isolation and Home isolation is actually very difficult to maintain. And in most Indian situations, it's very, very difficult. So in some sense, it's the choice of isolation and quarantine. Go between the home, a community managed institution and a hospital. If you need to have cooperation, you are going to have a situation where there is some choice given. So it's an upper middle class family who is willing for a home quarantine. You are able to provide some degree of inspection over it. You should be able to allow that. There is a crowded slum situation. There are old people in the home. There is a risk that the people in the home will get it. It's a nurse who is going to work in a COVID-19 ward, doesn't want to go home and infect her children and her mother, elderly mother there you should be able to create an in-between community managed institution where they have a reasonable halfway thing. It's a demand. No? All the nurses and uh, especially nurses and doctors have been, nurses have been demanding this very seriously, even going on strike for it. Going home for them, they, would, they don't want to shirk that duty. They're saying, give us alternate week duty and one week we are here, we'll stay in the hostel. I can't risk going home and infecting my child, my husband, my elder people in the house but over here it's all right and the site or hospital you need to do that you will need tracing and tracing needs volunteers it needs patients it needs trust it needs a high degree of cooperation right now most people hide in fact if they know they are coming at the end of the road they if you have a fever you, they'll take a paracetamol and sit quietly at their back it's a very, very dangerous situation that we've developed. And you need people to actually ring up and say, look, I may not be feverish, but I'm feeling a bit unwell. Would you come and check me out? And that sort of cooperation is very, very far. And the so social media, the South Korean model helped because it was not a non-threatening, it was a non-threatening, helpful model. 
But in India, isolation has become very coercive. Migrants are isolated, police brutalities, lockdown, FIRs have to be filed, demands for filing FIR against X, Y, Z, against film stars, uh, what and media hounding them, a complete loss of privacy, confidentiality, names being bandied, images being bandied around. We've gone about it in a terribly wrong way. And as a result, your results on this are coming so low, your isolation centers are actually become coercive centers. And you must remember Indian independence movement, one of its highlights was the shooting of a flight commissioner. And the hostility between the health system and the, this on the grounds of this is rising. The solution for it coming, Arogya Setu, is great, dangerous. It's got national security implications. And even before they have installed it for public health importance, they have started using its national security. There's even a court ruling which says, if he puts Arogya Setu, we can give him bail. Uh, there are places where they're saying that in metro you can't ride unless you have downloaded Arogya Setu. That's basically an app in the mobile which uh, lets not only you, lets everybody around know whether you are positive. It's an incitement to lynching in our context and which uh, provides information of where you are and tracks you irrespective of whether you want to be tracked or not. It's a serious problem in our situation. And it has very little relevance because finally, if you do not have trust and cooperation, you're not going to get it. The other notion of isolation by these circles, five kilometers, seven kilometers, plus another three kilometers circle, is a bit of nonsense. And this whole geography, it's not a miasma, it's a, not a katakarpu that uh, floats through the air and infects everybody at a certain distance. It's the social networking. It is, you may be a market vendor, then all the people who come to the market, you may the care provider and all the people, they may be your next door neighbor may be safer than the clients you have in an essential health service. The next door neighbor is at risk than many other people. So that physical distancing, blocking the door, allowing nobody to go in and go out, it's so much nonsense. In many countries in the world where there is a stay-at-home order, the order specifies that you are allowed to go out for essential services, but please keep it low. And you are allowed to go out for one hour walk per day. You can take a walk in the street. You can take it alone or with a member of your family or household. So if you want to walk with your spouse or your children, you are welcome to take that one hour walk. You just keep away a 10-meter distance. Here, what you have are all those scenes of uh, the whole road being sprayed with bleach, walls being sprayed. These are all photo ops. These are all drama being enacted, like fogging we do for dengue. They have absolutely no uh, sense. And this circular geographic hotspot, what it does is converts what is a social work and counseling function into a policing function. Because a policeman understands you put policemen at the gate and they are with their lathis, they are turning away and you feel you have contained the virus. You have done nothing of that sort because the few persons who are coming and going out would be essential services and the policemen themselves will get infected because they don't know either side who is infected. It's not a substitute to it and it is going to yield decreasing results as you go on. So there is a huge problem with what you need to do and what is the direction in which it is being done. And this sort of physical, geographical lockdowns of a few streets in some place, don't know what sense it makes on that. Of course, treating is another area. I think I should wind up a bit fast now. And you have mild and moderate going to observation. Severe, anybody with breathlessness is severe, will need hospitalization and will need oxygen. Oxygen, oxygen, oxygen. That's the key. You need a whole lot of oxygen if it's severe. Most people, 80, 85, 90% of people will get on their, on their own. Uh, a good number of people will not even know they had the disease, but even those who had the disease. But those who get severe will get breathless. They will become, uh, feel deep malaise and they will need oxygen. 
and critical care will need artificial ventilation and a whole lot of stuff. Now, one of the things government needs to do and says it has done is that it has created the capacity to do so. The Prime Minister talked of one lakh additional beds being created. These are not additional beds and herein lies a problem. These are earmarked beds. They are repurposing hospitals. What we were talking of and what countries did across the world was built in an additional surge capacity. Either permanent or temporarily, they build something additional to existing capacity. All the ventilators we have in our public hospitals are already under intensive use. Even in private hospitals, even now, without or before the COVID-19, we had a short supply of ventilators. Now, repurposing those hospitals for COVID-19 and in anticipation of COVID-19, keeping them vacant is actually pushing out people who are needing care into the streets or into private care and is causing a huge problem. There are cancer patients resting under flyovers because they are displaced from deaths. You are reaper the main public hospitals that are providing the bulk of secondary and tertiary care that the poor access are being shut down or sections of it are being shut down for repurposing. That was never the way it in UK or China or this. You either build a surge capacity if you have not already designed like South Korea and Germany, hospitals with a certain surge capacity. So if you do not already have surge capacity, you create surge capacity. You do not repurpose hospitals. If you do repurpose hospitals, some hospital which is poorly functional, not having started functioning can be repurposed. Or you can take over private hospitals. Very many of them are uh, not on essential care, providing a small and bring them under public authority. That's what Spain has done. That's what Ireland has done. That's what Portugal has done. That's what many countries have done to create such capacity so that as soon as the pandemic is over, they can return those hospitals to the private sector. And during that time, anyway, many of them are doing bariatric surgery, non-essential surgery, so they can be put off. But you do not create, take your main meals and convert them into repurpose because you then substitute one death by another there is a great worry that that is what we are doing. And in the private sector that is being certified for care, care, there is no ceiling on prices. The care is exorbitant, 12 to 15 lakhs and for patient. And at some point, we're not even sure. And then there is a lot of shutting down of hospitals and fear psychosis. So even where you displace these patients from the public hospital, you can't go to private hospitals because those are shut down in anticipation of the pandemic. So there is things that we can do, but things that are we are really not getting right. Finally, let me say a few words about lockdowns. Now, in lockdowns, in understanding lockdowns, a lot of what we have to do is unlearning. We have been fed a certain line of stage two, stage three disease that comes from clinically. Stage one is a localized cancer. Stage two, the cancer has spread, but you can excise and do a surgery, maybe a surgical strike and take it out. Stage three, stage four, it has spread all over and it is too late. It's terrible. Nothing can happen. You only do palliative care. That's not the logic of a pandemic. Between a community transmission and a non-community transmission, it is only a question of amplification. How many contacts are there? When you say local transmission, you mean that this is the cohort of patients and within that cohort, I can predictably 90% of cases will come within the persons within which I have kept under observation. So I don't need to lock down. I don't need to lock down because the cases will predictably come under the cohort that I have kept under observation. But when I don't know where the cases are going to come from, then I need to lock down or use larger measures. Which means what? which means when community transmission has already occurred. The fact today what they have defined it as, they say, oh, this patient did not have, we don't know where he got it, but we are doing inquiries. We will find out where he got it from. That's not the spirit of community transmission. Of course, he would have got it from somebody. It's a contagious disease. It can't have come from animals again. It has to come from other human infected humans. So that's not what it means. So you, the notion that you do 
this whole containment as a way to prevent our going into the community spread is so much nonsense. The first time you did it, you could say we bought time to get the health system prepared. That makes sense. But now it doesn't make sense. So how do you plan? What is the role? So when you have physical distancing, which is the big measure, which is a word I have not used at all so far, which is a general measure that people adopt, you also recognize that contacts occur at some places. So the difference between containment and mitigation, containment, the objective is to get the R0 factor, R0 factor below one endemicity stage. And mitigation, you are just lowering it, but you are not being able to, or you have not set an objective of lowering it below uh, one. But both of it, you do the same thing. You do identification, you do testing, you do isolation, you do treatment, you do tracing, and you do physical distancing. And when you do physical distancing, you understand that the infectivity of a disease is a function of the number of contacts that occur between people. And most models work out the number of contacts that occur at the home, at the schools and colleges, at workplaces and the community which can be divided into essential services, grocery, healthcare, etc., recreational spaces, sports, gym, cinema theaters, bars, restaurants, and gatherings at some cultural, religious, marriages, those sort of events. And then you have public transport. So these are the sites of such contacts. And you take a judicious choice about how to cut down one or the other. There are places where schools and colleges are allowed to run, but public transport or uh, workplaces are not. There are other places where workplaces are allowed to run, but schools and colleges not. Most of these countries have figures about social mixing rates and their models are based on those figures. And therefore, you can fine tune what it is. And lockdowns, you seldom require across the board and physically stopping all movements. You could very well say that I am going to allow all access to essential services and certain types of public transport with a certain lowered frequency, but recreation and cultural gatherings, I shall defer. You don't have to do, if it has to be a lockdown, not a uh, blade of grass shall stir. That notion of lockdown has become this strict lockdown, this bold person doing a strict lockdown and with a lot of brutality and think it's not productive. In fact, in all the models, when you lock down schools and colleges, you make the model also calculates that contacts at home will increase. Contacts in the community will increase because the children who don't go to school and don't go to this, then start going into community spaces. So in some sense, you have this complexity on this lockdown. So lockdowns have very little role. And in continuing phase, you need, you cannot stay in lockdown. The collateral damage because of the loss of essential services, wages, and I'm not even talking of economic crisis. I'm talking of just deaths due to other causes can be very large on that. So in some sense, I think this whole issue has gone on. It has played some role and you may still need in some places where transmission rates are very far many contacts of the, there is a surge happening. You may need to slow it down. You may have intermittent law. You can then give them notice. Tell people who have to reach home, families who are separated, migrant workers to take precautions and reach back because we are going to lockdown. Because it doesn't matter whether the migrant worker is caught here or caught there. He has to stay in a lockdown for 14 to 15 days. This recent Tamil Nadu order of yesterday, which locks down for four days in Chennai and three days in other cities, is some sort of drama which I can't see any possible public health rationale to it. So in some sense, we have to plan on an 18-month spree. It's not one month, two months. What we do on May 4th is perhaps what we will be doing on May 4th of the next year, unless we get through to a breakthrough on vaccine and drugs. And that, and hopefully not the next pandemic on that, but at some point, we do expect a surge later down this year. So that part of it, we should be prepared for. But one is very hopeful about a vaccine.
here is a set of already existing drugs which are repurposed so there are a lot of trials the hope on all those drugs are very limited so we are not yet sure about the drugs but a vaccine increasingly seems likely by the early part of next year and then the business of herd immunity becomes a different game altogether when you just go ahead and immunize the whole population and you are safe but until the such time you would have to go through this process and the death rates are manageable and because we have a younger population with about half the average age as Italy and with only about 6 to 8 percent above the age of uh, uh, 60, we would do much better. But we would have cases and we will need to isolate, otherwise we would have a runaway situation. So I am not in the group of pandemic deniers or saying that other deaths will manage it. I think without panic, in a systematic way, we can manage it. But this management is a complexity. Just using the police as your only tool and locking it all down, under the putting it all under the Home Affairs Ministry instead of the Health Ministry is both a lack of confidence and a lack of uh, adequate public health sense on the and I think the capacity, the institutional capacity to manage. So I think with this, I would stop and I think I've spoken long enough and leave it over to questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sundar, for the uh, presentation. I think... Uh, Vijayan, it's a time for question. Uh, so, you know, uh, can you please uh, take the control? Yeah, no problem. Um, uh, already a lot of... Uh, I see. Uh, can you... The speaker can... The first question is uh, from Sundar D. In this C, all the pins. Okay. You have been pinning it, right? Is any part of India entering third phase? Is that what you're saying? Uh, you know, uh, doctor, can you please, you know, run through the questions from bottom? That means you know just you know click click on the pinned messages. No, but uh, if I click on the top pin or the uh, bottom one. Uh, yes. The top yeah. one is a recent, and the bottom one. Okay. Okay. Question. So let us start from start bottom. Scrolling up, and that's what I am. Uh, see and all I... the pins. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. I got that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, or someone can read the message. Can you? Yeah, it would help me to read once you start. So the you can read the messages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The first question is from Dev Prakash. He is asking, please explain. I, I'll give a skip to right to health. That's a larger debate. I'll take that. Is there any connection between fourth industrial revolution and the lockdown? Shall I start with that? Okay. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, I'm not too sure about uh, that question. I understand it to mean the digital revolution. And certainly, a whole lot of what we are seeing, anyway, the beneficiaries of this lockdown financial are the digital giants. But other than that, I can see that uh, it has a lot to do with the nature of lockdown that has taken place. But remember, these control measures which we are talking around go back to the Middle Ages. In fact, the whole science of public health starts with the first question said to the scientists was to define the quarantine period. And they come up with a plague ships, uh, ships land and they want to keep the ships in the harbor till they decide when uh, uh, it is safe for people to disembark. And that's where public health science starts. It starts in the dark ages of the plague remedy. Eventually, some of the things we are doing today, including this identify, isolate, treat, you did not have uh, viral identification kits. But almost all the rest is very similar to what you are doing in some of these things. So there is a connection in the forms it has taken, but not quite uh, the same thing. Uh, what is the model adopted in 
Kerala related to testing. I'm going to take your question a bit more liberally. Kerala has got three things very right in this. And they got it thanks to their, partly the thanks to their Nipah virus experience and partly because of their Ardram program where they had already strengthened the public health services. The first thing they got right was a very, very intensive nature of contact tracing. They do very good contact tracing. They have almost 100 people home quarantined. Second, they have a very good system of outreach to the elderly, which is part of their palliative care program, which they are able to use not only for home quarantining, but also for providing supplies and what is called a shielding. Shielding, or what is now they are referring it to it as reverse quarantine. Kerala likes to create its own. Terminology. So they're calling it reverse quarantine. Shielding means you, Sweden is doing that. Many countries are, you keep the people at high risk. So they have, they know every panchayat has a project by which it knows the people who are on dialysis, the people who are on renal cancer patients, on immunosuppressives, the people who are bedridden, people who have comorbidities and elderly. Actually, they know that by every panchayat. So they know exactly who has to be shielded and they are able to uh, manage this in a much better way. So I think that's another big strength that they have. In terms of testing, they have tended to have uh, tested down their contact chain. They also have not done symptomatic care. There is some risk if they find a new cluster of diseases where they don't expect people are going to talk of them as things. So they have some risk, but they are now expanded to it. But therefore, they have also a low test positivity. But the other way, they are pretty good. And uh, uh, there is a much greater puncture local government cooperation. Stigmatization is the lowest in the country. So these are the big learnings from the Kerala model. There has been very, very little uh, victim blaming and uh, accusation and brutalities. So people will readily accept isolation and quarantine over there because it's very well supported. Uh, so when phobia is already prevailing with regard to Corona, how the government, this is the problem now. We will have to fight a thing and we will have to. So random asymptomatic changes is not going to, will help somewhere, but it is not going to be very useful. You would have to address this. At least let them start doing all the severe acute respiratory infections that come to the hospitals. That would be a great step forward. And also look at high risk people. So if you're looking at medical care providers, etc., you may also find the high risk cases. So there can be something done, but eventually they'll have to work hard in removing stigma on that. Uh, what are the prerequisites before lifting the lockdown? Uh, the, one of the prerequisites were getting prepared for testing. But now the pain of it is rising so much that you may have to lift and use clinical diagnosis where you cannot have tests. But at some point, what you have is not... I think we need to move away from uh, the term lockdown to different uh, types and standards of... Uh, uh, social and physical distancing and uh, selectively close down different functions but not all functions and not complete uh, areas so reduce the risk that i think in fact i don't make a case for any extension of lockdown except in very select places where there is a very sharp rise in ro when the r not figure you can calculate and then the r not figure has come into a doubling day time of four days or less. Then I think there is a going around about 2.5. Then there is a case for uh, a state level lockdown. But I don't think we need to use that. And even then give enough advanced information to people so that they can prepare for it. And lockdowns, if they happen, have to happen for 14 to 21 days. There is no point in a four-day lockdown. The person who is in the incubation period, the person in the infective period would not even have come out of it. Okay, there you need, even if you have a lockdown, you have to identify every case who develops a fever during the lockdown period and isolate. Otherwise, suppose he develops a fever on the 20th day of the lockdown. 
or the 14th day of the lockdown. The moment you lift the lockdown, he is infected. So the big problem with lockdown is the moment you lift it, the cases will come back again. Except that the starting point is shifted back. So uh, can you contain it to such a level that there are only a few cases and then you can track those few cases and you can lift the lockdown safely? That is a possibility. Kerala perhaps can do that because it has a low caseload. But the baseline caseload to reach to that level, you need a much greater level of information and the caseloads are you're not going to reach that situation. So therefore, you have to look at uh, this. Uh, there is a question that Amlor Pavanadhan is asking, whether for self-limiting short duration illness like flu virus, there is no concept of herd immunity. Can we bank on herd immunity? Now, this is a mixed question you've asked. First, Flu illnesses do cause herd immunity. They very well cause herd immunity. The problem with flu is it's a very mutation-friendly virus. So new, new strains appear and the vaccines which are prepared are not broadband. So you would have a new strain. Even in COVID, the SARS-1 strain and the MERS, uh, we have had two pandemics before with coronaviruses. This is the third coronavirus that has come. So this is the third pandemic within the last 20 years. The second one was from camels that it skipped to human being. The first one was also from bats. So coronaviruses, is, so the herd immunity is very effective. Even in dengue, it is effective. Even in measles, it is effective. It is a basic concept of epidemiology. In the epidemic diseases, you will have herd immunity. The point is, it will not protecting you against new strains of the disease. Okay, and it has nothing to do with short duration. Tuberculosis is very long duration illness, but doesn't provide herd immunity. So there are things that uh, have to be done. Herd immunity is not a strategy, but it is a fact. It is something, it's a, like a natural history. It's something that knowledge that it happens can be used to leverage it. Uh, this 5G fear that the US has uh, is really anti-China bashing and a fear psychosis that is built around China. The US has always had some form of it. Huh? There has been the notion of the yellow peril. There have been different forms of uh, anti-Chinese sentiment in many of these issues. So you're not going to, uh, it's not so new uh, in uh, this. So I, I wouldn't uh, bother too much uh, about the 5G part of it. Uh, that, that's just uh, uh, one of the greater stupidities of the whole issue, the anti-China fear. Otherwise, there's no way the 5G is related to it. Uh, it appears that the most current, the preprint says that only thing, no, look, Antigen tests are not flawed. Most of these tests are reliable in specificity. Their sensitivity will depend upon the viral load. Some tests can pick up a lesser viral load, like the new Roche test, compared to the earlier RT-PCR test. So you will always, all tests will have problems in sensitivity and specificity. A test has to be used in a context. And between tests, there are better and worse trade-offs are there. But we need not actually uh, look at it. The same thing out of antibody tests. The antibody tests are not all. There are something like 200 antibody test kits out there. What? 200 manufacturers. We have placed 33. We have approved the 33 uh, antibody test kit manufacturers. Of this 33, 30 are from China. Two are from South Korea. Korea and one hour from Israel. Hello? Right. So uh, there are, so we shouldn't generalize about antibody tests. We will need to see some of them come through when you, the best way to deal with the antibody tests is to go through the Chinese government. In which case there is a greater reliability. 
the chinese government doesn't hold uh, a brief who they are now starting to do this so the best thing to see with the uh, radio details is who is the chinese government so some of them the foreign country negotiates directly with the company sometimes for a better deal and then the same uh, degree of uh, uh, some the same degree of reliability is not there so the chinese government is trying to put its credibility is online so it's trying to do something but you must remember there are more than some 60 70 chinese companies there and you have to go through the process the tendering processes have had great problems the quality assurance systems are not in place and many of these tests inherently require field level feedbacks and fine tuning to achieve very good quality they take time to stabilize okay which also has not happened so there is a which is different from antigen tests antigen tests are easier to standardize they are costly but they are easier to standardize so plus and minus all of them have okay uh caleb j's question he asked there are reappearance of viral infections in discharge or recovered covid 19 now i don't relate it to lockdown i couldn't be even bothered about that lockdowns anyway are not on my agenda but it is a big problem because i would like to use recovered patients as a community asset because they are recovered they are immune they can be used in the front line of contact without so much as a ppe they can be used for testing they can be used for managing community quarantine centers if they are not reinfected now does infection with covid 19 provide immunity at least for 3 years who knows about lifelong the general expectation is that it does all such viruses have behaved dissimilarly and there is no reason why it doesn't most people who have tested have enough antibody titers and therefore again if they have igg titers then it does now there are of reinfection and there is a concern is this a relapse or a reinfection point 1 is it a problem in testing point 2 and is it that the person is particularly immunocompromised and therefore is unable to generate or retain the antibodies that he requires in all these three situations you may get but you must remember these are very rare exceptions and just because we locate a few exceptions we shouldn't jump to make it a rule so bottom line you don't get reinfected if it's very exceptional don't worry about it but we do need to before you discharge a patient even by today's protocol or you use him on front line duty you do need to test him to see whether he is virus negative so apply one test if he is negative go ahead and use it now uh, mani meghalaya asks that south korea and china got the infection back after they declared they are completely free no they never declared they are completely free we are not going to declare it no country has set the goal as elimination of the disease none the goal even in india there are five scenarios the last and the best scenario is called the disease has turned endemic meaning that ro is less than 1 but because of the nature of this disease it will stay with us till a vaccine is able to immunize it remember smallpox we eradicated it after there was a vaccine and even when we vaccinated it did not help we did vaccination along with immunization and isolation and identification and when we did all of it which we are saying now then it got eliminated so it will what south korea has done it has plateaued the curve so that it will predictably get 50 to 100 cases here and there immediately they will contact trace and contact trace and limit it from time to time there will be some outbreaks but they are well in control okay so our goal now is endemicity it is not elimination of the illness that will happen only it is because of low levels of transmission that will 
spreader, which is different from saying that you can have a second pandemic wave in the fall. That is a real serious issue, which I think we need to be prepared for. There are reasons to consider that that is likely to happen. And that happened in India during the 1918 pandemic also. So we should be even more careful about that. But no. So, so bottom line, we are not worried about South Korea, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, uh, Sweden, Iceland. All these countries have successfully handled the program. But they will continue to get a small incidence of diseases constantly which is all right. Like so many other problems, they'll take it in their stride. It will not lead to any significant loss of life. Okay. We have a number on rapid kits. I'll come back to... Uh, um, I think now there is a new positive case in Mulakulam. That's where I say contact with positive father admitted in hospital instead of family being quarantined. He must have got it before he got quarantined or he must have got it from where his father got it. So you remember one thing about physical distancing and this is very, very important when we are fighting stigmatization. Physical distancing reduces the risk of getting cancer. Uh, I'm sorry, of getting COVID-19. It will not eliminate the risk. You are less likely to get it, but you can get it. Therefore, the lesson is, if you do get it, don't feel guilty and blame yourself. Don't feel angry and blame others. This is the central thing against stigmatization. At some point, you have to recognize that this is the almost a natural phenomena. You will go through it. At some point, you need not feel guilty or hostile. You need not accuse anybody and you need not blame yourself. Physical distancing is overemphasized as a cure-all. It isn't. It reduces risk. It's like saying, if I don't smoke, my chances of getting cancer are lowered. It's even lowered by, let us say, uh, a lot. But having said that, it is not a guarantee that I won't get cancer. You may say I get it due to passive smoking, and people not involved in passive smoking also get it. So in some sense, Risk reduction and causation is different. The disease is caused by COVID-19. The number of heart attacks and strokes have dropped significantly post lockdown. What do you think the reason for it? I am always very suspicious about these. Death statistics are compiled after a time lag. We shouldn't jump to it. And if old people die preferentially of COVID-19 to heart attacks, when you know the average age of death under COVID-19 in Italy was 81. For a long time, it dropped to 79, but most of the people were very old. So at 85, your life expectancy is four years. You would die of a heart attack or a stroke within the next four years. So at some point, the lives lost are, you have to keep COVID-19 deaths within that radar. And yes, do we have, many of the deaths will occur at home. They will not get a diagnosis. Because at some point, heart attack requires an ease. I know of many patients of upper middle class families who died because they could not reach an intensive care ischemic heart attack, uh, uh, ischemic heart disease care in time. So, uh, in fact, it would increase, but it would be less notable on it. And I would say there are certain ways in which it helps. And this is a paradox. Smoking will decrease in this time. To some extent, in some families, alcoholism may decrease. To some extent, you may have, a, some people may have a better lifestyle. Air pollution decreases in this time. So there are certain social determinants that will move in a favorable direction. Therefore, some of these diseases could uh, reduce uh, to some extent. And therefore, you shouldn't make too much of it. But uh, the collateral effects of such a pandemic are many and varied. No simple solutions for that. Uh, 
hydroxychloroquine, there is increasing evidence it doesn't work. We are fortunate that Trump has ordered a lot and we have got rid of a lot of our manufacturer at a time when it's very difficult, but it's really got very little. And uh, today the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of the US has warned people against the use of uh, hydroxychloroquine. Trump has not changed his stand, but it never was proven. And now there is some sort of evidence that it is not working. But it's still not declared to be not working. The trial is still officially underway. Uh, can we use comprehensive Indian system of medicine against some therapy? As of now, there is no proven uh, therapy. And there is no candidate drugs which requires that level of testing either. Uh, I have answered that thing about negative people testing positive later. What about BCG? Now, this whole thesis of BCG having something to do rests on two foundations. One, India is having a surprisingly low infection and death rate. That's very questionable. One, it's early in the uh, disease profile. It may still worsen. And if you go by India is having such a good record, then you will see all countries which are of lower health sector, poor health systems performance and low social determinants also have very low cases. So we should be very, very cautious in saying that as a reason for saying that we have resistance or immunity. There is no reason to believe that. And the study, it is true that we have immunized our people with BCG, but so have many other countries which have not seen such a reduction in, uh, in uh, something. So the theoretical foundations of BCG are questionable, but converting it into a strategy is even more questionable than that. Still, it's something that research can look at. Uh, there is a hypothesis there that is worth examining, but not a very likely hypothesis. Now, this Swedish uh, government policy is something which is interesting. Now, Sweden has a mortality of 200 per lakh death rate, which compared to Italy's 432, Spain's 480, uh, Belgium's 567 is, is good. But they have no lockdown. Even bars and restaurants are open. Theatres are open. They have very little limitations that they have imposed. Just improved the testing. But even their testing rates are not very high. And they have a much older population which they are shielding. But having other than shielding this reverse quarantine, they haven't done much. Belgium, on the other hand, has had a very tough lockdown. And it was one of the states with an early lockdown, almost on par with India. Tenth day of getting the 100th case and at a lower level, they have locked down. Belgium has 567 deaths per million. So we are not very sure what is happening. But uh, Norway and uh, Finland has had a lockdown. Denmark has had a lockdown. And their death rates are 70 per million. Norway is 37. Finland is this. Germany is relatively low. We are remarkably low. Uh, uh, very similar situation to Spain and this, but a much lower death rate. So there are differences between these and they do much to with the age structure of the population and the existence of pre-existence comorbidities uh, rather than the lockdown. Mind you, the lockdown in these countries is a very different thing. They are called stay-at-home orders. They do not prevent you from going out for essential functions. They only prevent gatherings. And they prevent, uh, and wherever you go, there is some rules of physical distancing. You know, I have been in uh, some of these trains in some of these countries. Uh, sometimes they are so poorly crowded, you know, there is physical distancing in them, even when there is no COVID. So it's easy for them to do physical distancing on public transport. Not like our public transport. There will be, it's never... There are no people traveling standing there. So it's easy to manage it. So they never had lockdown in the way we've had lockdown. So all the Scandinavian countries. So it's a different thing altogether there. Sweden has not done badly. Sweden, Iceland, they've not done badly. They've actually done well without a lockdown. 
does uh, COVID-19 affect uh, tigers and cats? We don't know whether it affects them in the case of causing disease. Even in bats, we don't know that coronavirus causes disease. On the human body, there are very many viruses that do not actually cause disease. They are common cells. They are in passage. Maybe they will cause a disease in the animal you pet. We don't know that. We, we, so there is this cross uh, movement across species. So some uh, viruses cross over and mix with other viruses and mutate and then you get into a serious problem, which is a relatively rare occurrence, but a predictable occurrence over a century, four or five will behave that way. So there is some uh, degree of that. So in cats and tigers, they have detected virus. I don't know why they tested that tiger for COVID-19, uh, but they have tested it. But I would think that we are physically distanced from tigers, no? I don't know exactly how you will respond to it. So I don't know whether it causes disease in them or whether they are infective to human beings. Okay, so I don't really see yourself going very near the tiger. Uh, Apart from intensified surveillance and training, what do you do after lockdown? Isolation, isolation. Isolation is a very important issue on that. At some point, it is a big uh, home and physical distancing. Being able to understand where and which groups, subgroups, the disease is spreading and take appropriate measures, not, not TV friendly measures, not television friendly measures, not spraying the roads with bleach, which does precisely nothing, uh, but uh, doing things that will actually make a difference to transmission. It's so for many diseases. You know, actually, tuberculosis needs contact tracing. HIV needs contact tracing. You need contact tracing on leprosy. We don't do good. Typhoid in the world has been eliminated, but in India, it's a big problem because we don't do contact tracing the way it's done over there. It's a contamination, so the tracing is done differently, but it is done. Whenever there is a single case of typhoid reported, they will go back and find out the source. Uh, rabies is eliminated by a whole lot of uh, uh, tracing of where the dog must have got it from. There's a whole matter of be, that whole area, all the dogs will be picked up and acted upon. So I, I think this is a true of all contagion. And that is why we do not think of lockdowns as a public health measure. But somewhere public health gone a bit crazy. Um, we can use it to get prepared. But beyond that, you need physical distancing and you can choose subgroups for better physical distancing. But an overall lockdown, not a good idea. 